We are now going to move on to the third stage of um, uh, a child's life, according to Lacan. And this is the linguistic anthropological aspect of um, the process, although I've already really begun to discuss this, the symbolic, because I added a lot of it into the imaginary uh, phase, because we needed to begin to do the comparison to really get what's going on. But this is the symbolic and Lacan's big other, the big other, and that's a pretty cool name. And that sounds like a, you know, <laughs> sounds like a, a word for in a burger commercial. You know, you, you get a, the new burger by Burger King or something, the big other, do do do. You know, sounds like a, a new burger, which uh, uh, would be a, a cool thing to name a burger. But so, what is the symbolic? Well, according to Lacan, the big other is uh, the time in the child's life where there's a some sort of structuralism occurring in a social way. You know, there's a structuralist inclusion, a structuralist inclusion of customs, institutions, norms, practices, rules, traditions, rituals. The symbolic is a time when there's a collective symbolic order, a collective symbolic order. What does this mean? Well, it means that, you know, there's a whole community of people and uh, there's an order of symbolic processes that all work together concomitantly, concomitantly, coexistence, coexistence. And there's a condition of possibility for a singular subjectivity across the whole community. There's a condition. Okay, it's a condition. Um, and this is the, the condition is the collective symbolic order. Okay, it's never really realized, you know, especially as we are anthropologists and we think in an anthropological way and we do not think in a Marxist or we do not think in a, in a well, we do not think in a positive, positivist way. We're anthropologists, so we see that there is never um, a singular subjectivity. But that is what the uh, collective symbolic order um, suggests to us that there is some sort of possibility, some sort of possibility. It is an unconscious, the symbolic order is an unconscious uh, bound with the symbolic order of things, the symbolic, the symbols, producing an interconnected ideational, ideational representational web. So the basically, basically if we were to put that into one word, we would say a culture, a culture. You know, it's not really something that we can label as culture, but we're labeling it as culture anyway, just to get um, uh, an indication, some sort of um, uh, paremic, paremic, there's a good word for you, paremic, paremic, paremic is a definition really, a paremic um, idea of uh, what this means. The symbolic order is an unconscious bound with symbol, bound with symbol um, system producing an interconnected ideational representational web, according to Lacan. Okay, so there, then there are two, uh, two aspects of this unconscious. There are the real sides and there are the imaginary sides. The real sides, according to Lacan, of the symbolic are signifiers in their meaningless, nonsensical materiality, says Lacan and as visible marks and audible sounds. You know, it's interesting how the real is actually the, uh, the meaningless, nonsensical material, Lacan says. The imaginary, however, the imaginary sides of this symbolic order are um, symbolic and they're, of course, symbolic. They're signifiers paired with the signifieds to form meaningful, meaningful, significant signs. So this is what Lacan calls imaginary, the meaningful, the meaningful. The real, he says, are the meaningless, the meaningless. So the real, this chair uh, in front of me is meaningless. However, um, what it means to me is the meaningful, and that becomes the situated signification, according to Lacan. Now. Here we get into the, the crux, the central part of the symbolic order. The, again, uh, as we said before, Lacan tells us that the moment the child falls into language, the moment the child falls into language, it ceases to see itself as the ideal I. 
the moment the child um, starts to get language, the mirror, the mirror image of what it is, the mirror image of what it is ceases to be ideal. It ceases to see itself as the ideal I, but recognizes the absence of its name and the absence of its identity. Okay? The moment it starts to see the... So, I'm going to use a word now uh, that I shouldn't use. I'll be cursed, but at any rate, I'll use the word gender. Because a child um, learns how to fit itself into a gender system, a gender system. And in doing so, um, it ceases to see itself as ideal, but recognizes the, the, the absence of um, who it is and its name and everything, because there are other um, elements in the gender system of genderized and gender system of language. Okay, so hence, as it assumes a, um, the, uh, it, that, it, that it's a part of a, a gender system, a system symbolic order, it assumes um, uh, that there is a thing um, called the name of the father. Uh, the name of the father is very central to Lacan's uh, uh, work and in the symbolic order. So it begins to recognize competition in desire. Okay, so it begins to compete with itself, with others, with the community, with others in the community, uh, in the social order of things. Um, it competes for desire and in desire. Okay, so in this competition then, in this competition, uh, Lacan tells us that uh, the child begins to recognize what itself desires is not accessible, the inaccessibility of its desire. The child sees something and wants it, but as soon as it gets it, the desire is gone. So Lacan tells us then that the child has no option but to admire at this point, admire while envying and objectifying desire as it lacks the father. So, you know, um, when the father disappears or the, you know, the apparition of the father disappears, uh, the father, the powerful agent disappears, the child does what? It admires, envies and says, well, you know, there's a lack, I want this. And he continuously attempts to uh, obtain this missing thing, this missing image, this missing agent, agent which is the father. It then submits to the social order and supersedes by desiring it and continuously desiring something which it can never attain. So the object of lack perpetuates desire. And this is not physical, says Lacan, but by nature it has to be symbolic because the symbol is the object which presents to us the signified which is forever changing, forever inaccessible and hence forever presents us with a lack. So, whether individually or socially, an ego ideal, an ideal ego, an ego, an ego ideal emerges, but it's no longer the self I as it was in the imaginary stage, in the symbolic stage. Um, it's no longer what one has, but through the gap we open by language semiotics, the gendered aspect of language semiotics is what one recognizes that one lacks because it's a semiotic and there is a signified which is forever unattainable, according to Lacan. The signified is unattainable. We cannot get to the signified. It's, the whole idea is that the signifier um, emerges within us and it presents a signified, but as soon as we uh, get to that, then there's a new signifier, new signifier. The symbolic order, Lacan tells us, is contingent on symbolism as it becomes a century perceptual phenomenon determined by social linguistic structures. Okay, so what is the process? The process is as follows. In the real stage, the, um, the effect that the real stage is most strongly connected to is a need. need. The imaginary, at the imaginary stage, the process it's most strongly connected to is demand. And in the next stage, the symbolic, the process it's most strongly connected to is desire, Lacan tells us. And within desire, of course, is the emergence or the acquisition of elements of language and narrative. narrative. So upon entering into language, 
says Lacan, upon entering into language, the child accepts these narratives, rules, and dictates. With the acceptance of uh, language's rules, the child aligns with what Lacan tells us is the Oedipus complex. So what does the child do then in this um, process uh, with, within the symbolic order? The child begins to negotiate its membership within a community. Okay? Through uh, negotiating the, uh, or recognizing the name of the father, the agent, the agent. And uh, Lacan tells us that it is in the name of the father, it is in the name of the father that we must recognize the support of the symbolic function which from the dawn of history, says Lacan, has identified this person with the figure of the law. But Freud tells us, if we go back to Freud, Freud tells us that, look, the symbolic through language is the pact which links subjects together in one action. It's the symbolic, it's a symbol. The human action par excellence is originally founded on the existence of the world of the symbol namely on laws and contracts. And Freud tells us that this is the symbolic. Let's have a quick look at the process then that occurs during this um, stage of, or within this stage of the symbolic order. On the left we have the imaginary and that's the stage that we looked at before. On the right we have the symbolic. And what happens is that desire enters into the realm of language from which it cannot escape. And the realm of language is eternally inescapable, according to Lacan, eternally inescapable. Upon entering into language, says Lacan, desire is forever bound up with language deployment. When entering the realm of language, there is no escape. If we look at the next diagram, we see that we have a series of uh, signifiers, and uh, these objects have, of course, symbolic strength in the social order. Um, Language is central to signification. Yes, it is, of course, because language is a system of signs. Um, and the linguistic symbols mediate signification. So language is a system of interconnected signs, signifiers, which affect a certain organization in the system. They're guided linguistically by the name of the father, the agent. The signs are regulated and organized socially and culturally through a desire for perfection. As we desire perfection, we move across these signs, this organization of signs. And hence, we achieve socialization through and to language. This is how the socialization process works through our desire to uh, move across uh, a system of signs. I'm going to now speak about something that I promised I'd speak about before. This is the Oedipus complex. The Oedipus complex, you know, if you remember from Greek mythology, uh, or if you know uh, about Greek mythology, you'll know that, of course, Oedipus was the, um, uh, the, uh, the person who was born and discarded and then realized that um, later on that he had um, procre procreated with his mother and he had also killed his father. And you know, his mother wasn't very happy about that. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, according to um, now Freud, the, you know, Oedipus takes on a new meaning and, well, a slightly different meaning, and Freud in, uh, uh, adapted that Oedipus, um, idea of Oedipus to describe some of his work. Lacan maps the Oedipus complex. Uh, Lacan took it and he, he mapped it onto the acquisition of language elements, which he saw as analogous. The process of the Oedipus complex is recognizing the need to obey social strictures and to follow a closed differential system of language in which we understand self in relation to others. This is the Oedipus complex according to Lacan. Understanding yourself, basically understanding yourself in relation to others and how you fit into the, the system, the, the systematic and dare I say systemic order of uh, society. In the Oedipus complex, the child develops a sexual affinity, a sexual affinity for the parent of the opposite sex, you know, whoa, you know, uh, and repels the parent of the same sex. So if I'm a boy, then I develop some sort of sexual affinity for my mom, and if I'm a girl, I develop a sexual affinity for my dad, thus positioning myself in society through a sort of a kind of sexual signification. In this linguistic system, 
Alacant tells us that the phallus, the phallus which originally signified the, the penis, well, did it really in, in Egyptian archaeology, um, did it really represent the phallus or did it represent the, the god king, you know, re-emerging in every one of us or something. Anyway, archaeology is far from us here, but we may come back to it or discuss it sometime because it's very interesting. Egyptology is very interesting. Uh, in the linguistic system, Lacan tells us, the phallus replaces everything the subject loses. The phallus is not the material penis, it's something else. It represents everything the subject loses through the entrance into language. It's that lack, that lack. And all the power associated with what Lacan terms the uh, symbolic father, the symbolic father. It's the powerful agent, uh, the power of whom the person loses, and hence uh, that becomes the idea of the phallus. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor, of course. The power of the phallus is the power that the person loses. Uh, however, it gets more complex in to have and to do uh, the phallus, to have the phallus, to do the phallus. Well, later on, we'll look at Judith Butler and Michel Foucault and everything, and you know, we'll discuss that in detail. The name of the father is analogous to, according to Lacan, structures that control life. The agent, the agent, the, the agency, the structural agency, or the identified structure, should I say. Law, religion, medicine, education, all these are, you know, grand narratives. Okay, so let's quickly look at a, a diagram. Uh, the diagram is a diagram, of course, we begin again with the signifier and the signified, the basic description there. And we see that at the top we have the self and then at the bottom we have the other. The self becomes signified and the mediator is sex and gender. And there are semiotic differences which prevent the distortion of the system in sex terms, where the signification becomes, only becomes possible in the presence of differentials, gender or sex. The other is also signified and the same thing happens. The signification only becomes possible in the presence of certain differentials and the other is signified into whoever the other can become or appears to become. And this is the sexual signification where society operates through a system of gender and sex differences. The same thing happens with language. Exactly the same thing. Language becomes a mediator where the self and other are both signified to become something they appear. So linguistically, uh, this happens, that is, a society operates through a system of linguistic difference. So in this way, we see that the self, mediated by sexuality or by language, integrates into society and in, into the symbolic order in one way or another, and more so in an infinite array of possibilities. Let us now look at the psychic dynamic of fantasy versus lack, which was also quite central to uh, Lacan's work. Uh, we see the sense of reality in and through language constructed or construction, Lacan tells us. Um, and this uh, points to nothing other than the socialized or the social or socialized development of the subject. And we've spoken repeatedly about the fact that uh, this socialization only occurs because of the endless misrecognition of the real. And by misrecognizing the real, there's a continuous uh, signification as to what the real is. And it's endless. It's a perpetual infinite symbiosis. And following this perpetual continuous symbiosis, the signified is continuously unattainable continuously desired, continuously followed, and hence um, the, this process is ongoing. Okay, so by looking at this diagram, let us look at this diagram now, and we have on our left the signification process, of course, our basic diagram, and in the middle we have our object which becomes constructed language. And the object may be in imagination, and when it becomes constructed language, of course, it becomes a certain reality. And this process occurs mediated by um, the socialization pathway. Once this um, constructed language becomes a reality, we see the emergence of the socially developed subject, which desires a socially developed real, but can never attain this real. There is a pathway to the socially developed subject who desires the socially developed real, but can never attain this real. 
we continuously construct, according to Lacan, we continuously construct reality in this process and hence compensate for our continuous attempt to recognize the real world materiality. In the same way, according to Lacan, we continuously create linguistic and social science which ultimately transform to reality and this becomes our construction of reality. So by continuously uh, creating linguistic and social science, uh, we transform these to our reality and it becomes our construction of reality. Uh, the diagram, of course, there's the signifier, signified basic construction at the left, and then our object, our imagination, becomes our linguistic and social ideologies, and this set of these all together become our construction of reality. We become reliant on linguistic and social versions of reality, and thus a pure materiality of the real as um, Lacan has told us, disrupts our lives because we've become so reliant on the linguistic and social version of reality. So once we encounter a pure um, materiality, the real, then there is a disruption and more so a trauma. It's traumatic. So let's look at this diagram again. And on the left, we have our signifier signified, basic structure, our imagination, uh, through imagination, we create a linguistic and social reality, and this occurs until we encounter the materiality of the real, then there's a disruption. I have placed the Persian diagram there. So, what does this mean? What does this tell us? There's a certain tension in between the real and the reality or the symbolic. Reality comprises you know, social laws and meanings and conventions and desires and um, social precepts and everything. There's a tension, and this tension, according to Lacan, according to Lacan, this tension is the motive for our psychosexual lives. And Lacan tells us that not even our unconscious escapes the effects of language, not even our unconscious. In fact, in fact, Lacan goes on to tell us that the unconscious is structured like a language, Lacan tells us. So what is then Lacan's psychosexual development? It's predicated on the subject's ability to recognize iconic signs followed by language. So Lacan, this is where Lacan really starts to get interesting because it's all about language and the subconscious, language and the subconscious.